Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'd uh, like to welcome you to the Simons Institute Theoretically Speaking series. And today is the lecture on monitoring people and their vital signs using radio signals and machine learning by Dina Katabi from MIT. And uh, before we get started, I just want to go over how you can ask questions in the event. Um, so we have people here at Calvin Lab and remotely on Zoom. A, and people here obviously can just raise their uh, hands and people on Zoom can ask questions using the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel. And um, I guess Dina, if she notices a, during the talk, she might answer, but really we have reserved 10 minutes at, at the end of the talk for the Q&A. Uh, so I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Shafi Goldwasser, I'm the director of Simons Institute. Uh, this is an institute for theory of computing and uh, it's a place to convene uh, um, theoreticians in, in the joint fields, uh, applied people, people in other fields like biology, physics, neuroscience, and so forth. And uh, especially young scholars uh, trying to uh, train them and um, welcome them into the community. And uh, we, um, uh, it's very important for us as a mission is to expand our horizons from the sort of narrow uh, theory field to fields uh, outside and to beautiful achievements from outside the theory group uh, or the theory uh, topic. And today's lecture is a really testimony of that. In, it's open to the wide public uh, and um, our speaker is gonna be uh, Dina Katabi, who's uh, Thuan and Nicole Pham Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computing, uh, Computer Science at MIT. And she's a MacArthur Fellow and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. She's a leader of the network group at MIT, a part of the computer science and a artificial lab, an artificial intelligence lab, and a director of the MIT Center for Wireless Networks and Mobile Computing. And she received her PhD and master's degree from MIT uh, in 2003 and 1999. So she's a real, um, I guess, MIT, <laughs> MIT -er. and her bachelor from uh, the University of uh, uh, Damascus in 1995, and her research interests span uh, lots of topics, mobile systems, machine learning, health internet of things, wireless networks, and she's also worked on compressed sensing. There's a, she's a lot of very beautiful uh, papers that actually touch uh, algorithms and, uh, and complexity theory. And uh, she has received multiple prestigious awards including the ACM Prize in Computing, the ACM Grace Mary Hopper Award, two SIGCOM Tests of Time Awards, the Sloan Fellowship, the IEEE Communication Society, uh, William and Bennett Prize, and uh, multiple Best Paper Awards, as well as the MacArthur Award. And uh, she's also spun several startup uh, from her lab, and uh, she has her own uh, startup as well. So please welcome uh, Dina Katabi. I'm extremely excited uh, to hear her lecture and I'm grateful that she was willing to come and tell us about her work. Please Dina, take it away. Thanks Shafi. Hi everyone. I'm so excited to be here and to uh, present to you. So uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, some of my recent work about using the combination of radio signals and machine learning to monitor people and their health. Yeah, can you just so, speak, uh, speak a little louder? Oh, the, the volume will be, okay, all good. So should I do something? Should I speak louder? A tiny bit. Okay. So yeah, so as I said, like I work on uh, the intersection of radio signal and machine learning. And uh, one of the things that really uh, excites me and um, about radio signals in particular, if you think about it, we are all living in, in a sea of radio signals. And these radio signals bounce off our bodies. And uh, when they bounce off your body, they actually get modulated by your physiological signals, by your breathing, by even the pulsing of your blood, uh, the twitching of your muscles, even like the small eye muscles here. Uh, when any, any movement that you do actually leaves a trace on the radio signals around you. And a natural question to ask is, can we decode that information from the radio signal? Can we just analyze those radio signals that bounce off your body and from that can tell so much about your health. 
So this is exactly the question that occupied me and my research group at MIT. So we started thinking and working on uh, this uh, new project that was new to us like eight years ago. And when we started looking into it, but basically can we design a box that looks very much like your Wi-Fi box at home, but it's much smarter. Instead of just purely sitting there and being just your Wi-Fi box, we are going to analyze these radio signals and uh, we are going to uh, get from that your sleep, your breathing, your gait, your heartbeat, uh, your interaction with other people. And when we started, it was just a question, can we do it? And over time, we discovered indeed that we can do it. And we developed this box that we call it the Emerald Box. And one of the reasons why we can do this is actually the ability to analyze radio signals using advanced and customized machine learning model. And in this talk, I'm going to show you what we can do with this kind of method and what kind of signals and information we can get about people. So let me start with uh, just an illustration. So radio signals spread in the environment, they reflect off our bodies because our bodies are full of water. And some of these reflections come back to our device, which analyzes them using machine learning here. In this case, it would detect a fall and can alert the, the caregiver via, via text, email, or phone call. So, so this is just an illustration. Now let's see what we can get with real people. So this is actually one of our earlier work. Uh, so this is an office at M MIT CSAIL and you see my students standing in the middle of the office. Now our device is not even in the same office. It's going to monitor him from the adjacent office behind this big arrow where you see the device is behind the wall. So we're gonna monitor, monitor him from the adjacent office. Now the sweat dot here, that you see where my, my cursor is. This red dot is where the device thinks that he is. So as he moves, you can see that the red dot is tracking him. And you can see that we are tracking his movement from the adjacent office, from behind the wall, very accurately. He doesn't have any device on himself. It's purely based on how his movement is changing the electromagnetic waves around him. Now, of course, whenever we, we do such a, uh, a design, we compare it with a gold standard. In the case of motion, we compare it with something called Vicon Motion Capture Room, and we can show that we have an accuracy that is 89%. So when we, when we do this, we started thinking, okay, what can, what can we do with being able to monitor people accurately in their motion? And we discovered that actually, if you can get gait speed, it's very important for a variety of diseases. So one of the things that I have to tell you, this is very different from, being, uh, from having a Fitbit because Fitbit just monitor your acceleration. So it doesn't monitor your exact gait and it doesn't know where you are, so cannot get exact gait speed. It just get acceleration. While here we are getting your gait speed, and that actually is a metric that is used typically even in approval of drugs for Parkinson's, for Huntington's, for, for ataxia, multiple sclerosis. It is also a predictor of exacerbation in diseases like CHF and COPD. Now we can, with this like smarter Wi-Fi like box in the home, we can get it 24 seven without asking people to wear wearables or to uh, worry about charging devices at all, and even through walls. So we started asking, what else can we get? Like, can we just get something that is different uh, from just motion? So one of the things that is very particularly interesting to me is sleep because I, I have problems with sleep. So we started looking at, okay, can we get sleep? And I'm sure many of you guys are thinking, yeah, I can understand maybe she's like getting the motion from sleep. So that's, that would be a, a metric of assessing sleep based on ectigraphy. So when somebody moves, you say that they are not asleep. When they're static, you say that they are asleep. But it turns out that we can get something more deep than just movement. So when you go to sleep, your brain waves change and you enter different stages. Awake, light sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movements. 
Now, these sleep stages are, of course, underlying a variety of, they are, of course, they are very important for sleep disorders. And perhaps you know that one in every three people in the US has sleep problems. So it's very important to understand these sleep stages for sleep disorders, but actually it turns out that sleep stages are important for a variety of diseases. Just think about something like depression, for example. So intuitively, we know that when you have mood disorders, your sleep get disturbed, but it turned out that also like this REM stage here is very important for depression because one of the things that happens during depression is that REM starts happening too early during sleep. So today, if you want to get sleep staging, you send someone to a sleep lab like this. They put all of these electrodes on his head and body, and they ask the person to sleep like this. Now, of course, it's very hard to sleep with all of these sensors on, one, on one's body, but also you can imagine like you cannot do this every night. You might be able to do it one night or two nights, but you can't really continuously do this. Now, let me show you how we monitor sleep. So this is our device. It transmits very low power wireless signal, analyzes the reflection using machine learning, and spits out the sleep stages throughout the night. So what you see here, this graph, is something that is called a hypnogram. For every 30 seconds, it tells you which sleep, uh, which sleep stage the person is in. So it can be like here in deep sleep or awake, etc. And now, of course, as I said, for every, for every health metric, we compare to the gold standard. In the case of sleep staging, uh, we compare to something called PSG. And here you see the confusion matrix. And you can see that our accuracy is on the order of like 80% uh, accuracy. And remember, this is 80% accuracy on every 30 second of sleep. So on assessing every 30 second of sleep. So, so it is actually that is comparable to a sleep lab when you get a sleep technician to look at the data. But I want to also get a feeling for how, how uh, like, what does it mean to get this 80% accuracy in sleep staging? So let me show you here. On the x-axis, this is the time, uh, like you see, like zero is midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. On the y-axis, you see the sleep stages. And you see a, a prediction of the sleep staging using PSG. And we said this is a gold standard in medicine and Emerald prediction, which is our device using just like this wireless signal reflected of, someone, of someone's body. And we, you can see that this person went to sleep around midnight here and he was asleep until 2 a, uh, sorry, he was awake until 2 a.m. And then around 2 a.m., he fell asleep, so he moved from uh, from like uh, awake to light sleep, and then he uh, he had an excursion into deep sleep, and then again woke up again around two thirty, was awake for about an hour until three thirty, and then fell asleep again, and then went to deep sleep. So you see, like each one of these is is a sleep cycle. So one sleep cycle, second sleep cycle, third sleep cycle for sleep cycle. And if you compare the two graphs, you see that we are very, like very accurately getting the sleep uh, structure. So you can see very much, this is the same sleep for the same person. The only differences are these, this region like this, when the sleep technician is looking at the data and is saying, okay, like 30 seconds, uh, I'm saying light sleep, then 30 seconds, deep sleep, light sleep. You see machine learning model likes to consolidate this kind of period. So it just consolidated these things into one sleep stage. But it is quite accurate. Now, another thing is uh, we can monitor breathing. So this person is sitting like you guys and like what you see on the screen is his inhales, exhales. We ask him to hold his breath and you see the signal stays at a steady level because he exhaled, he did not inhale. And again, for everything we compare with a gold standard, in this case, it is a FDA approved uh, device. Uh, it's like a, a belt that the person wears on their body and that belt is uh, going to give you the respiration. Now I wanna zoom in on the signal. This is the same respiration signal. What you see here is the inhales and the exhales. And you see this, these blips on the signal, these small blips. At the beginning, we thought that this is noise on the signal, but it turned out actually that we, we are able to get his heartbeats. 
So Im imagine we are able to get the pulsing of the blood from this person without touching him purely because it changes that pulsing of the blood changes the electromagnetic waves around him. So with all of these signals, we can get all of that stuff. Imagine sleep, movement, breathing, heartbeats without touching the person and even from behind the wall. So how does it work? How can we, how, how come we are able to get all of those things? So if you think about it, when you transmit a wireless signal, of course, we all know that wireless signal traverse walls on occlusions. And they reflect off the human body because our bodies are full of water. So some of these minute reflections come back to our device. Now, if you think about it, like we all know this very basic equation, distance equal to reflection time multiplied by the speed of light. Electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light. So we all know the speed of light. So if we can measure the time it took the signal to go back and forth, we can track the distance of this person. So we can track the movement of this person. So, so this is a very uh, simple principle. And in fact, this is a principle underlying radar. This is like basically when you, when you think about how we track uh, object in the sky using radar, it is based on these simple principle. However, uh, when, you, when you start thinking about that, you say, okay, so I need the reflection time. How do I measure reflection time? So one way to measure reflection time is to organize your uh, transmitted signal in something in, in, uh, in a way that is called FMCW. So let me explain this. So you can transmit a signal where the time and the frequency have linear relationship with each other. So the frequency of the signal changes linearly with time. Now, when this signal reflects off some object, you will get a received signal and the distance between in time here is equal to the reflection time. But this reflection time is related to the change in frequency at any point in time between the transmitted and received signal because you chose your signal to be where the frequency changes linearly in time. So you can get the reflection time using a very simple equation by dividing the difference in frequency, taking Fourier transfer, uh, transform basically, and dividing the difference in frequency by the slope of the signal that you transmitted and you get the time. And from that, remember you can now, you know the time, you can multiply it by the speed of light so you know the distance. So are we done? Unfortunately, it is not that simple. So uh, this, is, this is how radar work, but if, if it were only just uh, this, we would have done this long, uh, long time ago. Now, the problem with this is that humans and uh, the environment that humans live in is much more complex than the sky and having one object in the sky. So let me just show you this. So if you go back and you, understand, you analyze our problem, we have a person in, in the environment and the radio signal not only reflects of our human body, actually it reflects of everything, of the table, the wall, the screen, the computer, everything. So, and not only it reflects of these objects, but it bounces around from one object to the other. So you get these secondary reflections. So instead, like if just the signal reflecting of me, Dina, now the signal is gonna bounce off me, then bounce off the wall, then off the, the screen of my TV, and then go back to the, to the device. And now all of these objects start moving with me. And so you get so many fictitious uh, targets. And instead of getting just this one single person, you get just a mess of signals. And this is why it's not that simple to just take uh, radar principles and apply them to people and minute motions like the pulsing of one's blood. So this is, this is a good starting point to use radar, but it's not the full story. So here you get something called multipass effect. So the question becomes, how do we extract the human body from this mess of signal? And remember, I, just, I don't just need to know where, the, where this person is. I want health metric. I want to know when the person is in REM versus deep sleep. These are not motion. This is something very different. So how do I do this? And the answer is that we use a neural network that are customized for uh, radio signals. 
So I'm not going to get into the details of this, but for, for the just general audience, I'm sure all of you guys have seen neural network, but instead of taking images or audio signal, we take radio signal, we push it in a custom neural network. Of course, this is just like a, an illustration. But then the question that we ask at the end of this neural network, we ask questions about the health of the person. So basically predict for me from using this radio signal, whether this person is awake, asleep, uh, what is their movement, what is their respiration, all of that stuff. So, so this is at a very, very high level, and I'm happy to, to answer a question. I just want to talk a bit about the kind of challenges that you face when you deal with this that are different from just operating your network on images or on uh, text like NLP. So one of the big problems is that we face is how do you generalize to new home? Let's say that I took my device and I trained with Dina's signal and Dina's home, uh, David, Chris, all of those people. I need now to take it to a new person. Let's say that we take it to Shafi's home and we want to monitor Shafi's sleep. So the device never seen Shafi before and never seen her environment. So we want to be able to generalize to Shafi's home without asking Shafi to train again with the device. So, so in this case, we call these like, uh, let's say, uh, Dina and uh, so uh, like some of these subset of the people where there are source domain, and we want to generalize to a target domain. Now, the biggest problem with doing this, I just told you that radio signal depends on the environment. It reflects off everything in the environment. It reflects off people and their uh, bed, their walls, their like whatever. So it's going to be very different from one environment to the other. So one of the biggest issues that we face is how do you remove extraneous information irrelevant to the task from the signal and leave only the information that is relevant to the task? And this is even much more complex than just an image, because if you think about an image, you will have like one, one uh, photo diode on the image will be just part of either like from one object, like each photo diode has one object. But here, even every single time sample of the signal might have reflections from multiple objects at the same time. So let me uh, answer Shafi's question. Shafi, you have uh, your hand raised. Hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Yeah. My question was on the previous slide when you were uh, showing the picture of the neural net. So, are you going to get your uh, labels from the state of the art benchmarks? Am I going to get labels from what? So, for example, uh, you have a signal and you have, uh -huh. in, in your training stage, uh, you have some information about whether parts of the signal at the 30 seconds windows were associated with a certain type of sleep. So you're getting that from the uh, state of the art devices? I see. So, so, so actually you are asking a very important question. That's one of the challenges. So how do you get the ground truth for these tasks? So uh, like typically people like when in, in images or in NLP, they train by giving that signal to humans and say label my signal, say this is a cat picture, this is a dog picture. I cannot give my signal to someone and say, look, Tell me whether Shafi was in light sleep versus deep sleep during this time. No human would know or uh, from the radio signal how to analyze this. So, that, so that's a big challenge. And one of the things here is that depending on the task, we have to find uh, a uh, synchronized with, the, with a system that has the ground truth and have the RF signal synchronized with that system. But uh, every task has a different ground truth system that we need to synchronize with. And uh, so in the case of the, uh, if the sleep, for example, that I showed, we just, we went to MGH here, like uh, we, we put our devices in their sleep lab, we synchronize with, uh, with their system, and then we, we get the answer from their system, and then we, we map it to the answer in the RF signal. And for other things, we, we always have, like, this is one of the biggest things is how to do this. And one of the, the very interesting things that we are working on now is can we actually do self-supervision from the radio signal? And how do we do self-supervision from radio signals? 
uh, because on one hand, it's easy to put an antenna and just collect a radio signal. If we can do this, that would be very interesting. On the other hand, actually radio signals, like you know that when you see image, you know the type of information that exists in an image. So we know images like capture, whatever, the light that we see with our eyes. So it doesn't have more information than typically you would see with uh, a very good eyesight but we don't really know all the information that exists in radio signals. So there might be some information that even we, we haven't thought that they exist in radio signal. And if radio signal can learn from themselves, then they can extract things that we don't even know exist. And I'm going to get back to this point later when I, told, when I show you how we diagnose Parkinson's disease. Okay, so so so, but this is this is very relevant question, and I'm not going to answer like how do we do these things. Uh, I try to keep this at a high level so that it's not um, it's accessible to a general audience. But happy to answer questions. So in the case of how do we generalize, for example, we designed a particular conditional discriminator, and we can prove that this discussion we can model it and prove that that conditional discriminator, for example, uh, in the in equilibrium, it removes exactly the extraneous information but leaves the useful information. But there are other challenges. Actually, we just touch, uh, touch on some of these challenges. Uh, for example, data labeling, how do you label radio signals? This is one of the challenges. Uh, we'll just talk to Shafi about it. Uh, how do we learn without label? We touch on this and there are in, in machine learning, there are ways to learn without labels like contrastive learning, but they are very dedicated for images and NLP. You can't just take them as they are and extend them to radio signal. And one of the things to think about, particularly not just radio signal, like me medical data, for example, all of this new modality, how do you learn from them without labels? Uh, the other thing is how do you separate physiological signals from multiple people? So I showed you one person, but actually we can extend to a variety of people in the environment. And uh, but basically uh, we, we do this with our, with our devices. And finally, how do you do domain generalization and transfer learning? I'm happy to talk about all of that if you ask me question about it, but let's, uh, let's focus, uh, let me show you a bit what we can do. So let's go back to, to, this, uh, to this figure here. I showed you that we can track the movement of this person. But one of the things that was bothering me when I was working with my student, I said, okay, look, I mean, we get this dot, but I look at this dot, I don't know whether he's standing or sitting. I know his location, but I just cannot tell whether he's standing or sitting or what is he doing in that location. And then when he was moving, like remember, like he was moving, you see this dot sliding. You don't know whether he advanced with his right foot, uh, right foot or left foot. So now fast forward, this is, as I said, one of our earlier results. So let's fast forward and let me show you what we can get today from radio signals behind a wall, okay? So here what you see, the big frame is what the radio signal sees. This is what our device, these skeletons is extracted by our device. This, uh, this RGB here is just so that you can see what is happening inside the room. So I'm going to play the video for you and look at these skeletons and whether they are tracking through the wall, the people inside the room. So you see when he sits on a chair, now we can actually know that he's sitting on a chair, not just his location. When he stands up, we know he stood up. When he moves with his right foot, we know that it is the right foot versus the left foot. So all of this is, all of that information, imagine we can extract from radio signals through walls. And that would not be possible without these neural networks that, as I mentioned here. Okay, so here you see more people. These are five people. And so that I show, I'm showing you that we can work with multiple people. It's not necessary that we just have one person in the environment. I wanna show you also that we can get the actions of people. So here what you see, so the skeleton at the top from the radio signal, and he's emulating combing his hair and you can see the skeleton also comes his hair. So he's moving, he's gonna emulate a few things. So he's emulating drinking. You see clearly the skeleton drinks. 
Oh, so he's gonna try to put some stuff in his pocket. You see the skeleton is acting the same way as he's acting. So imagine being able to track through all these actions of people just purely through the wireless signal without a camera, without any visual access. Now, over the last three years, we have been working with doctors in a variety of diseases, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, uh, rare diseases such as FSHD, atopic dermatitis, uh, immune diseases like atopic dermatitis, Crohn's, and uh, COPD, also pulmonary disease. And finally, also we worked with COVID, of course. And I wanna show you some of the results from the from actual patients in real diseases. Like what I showed you earlier are my students and getting something in the lab. This is one of the things that I learned the hard way. Uh, as academicians, we, we try to set up things in the lab and show that they work. But actually when you go to the, right, to, to, to the real world, the amount of uncertainty is huge and it's just completely different. So let me show you what we can do with real patients. So this is our device. So as you can see, it is very non-obtrusive. It sits on the wall and just like you can, you can completely forget about its existence. So I'm going to show you first some of the results with Parkinson patients. And this is from a study. It's a, it's a large Parkinson center called the Udall Center funded by NIH. And it's a collaboration with Dr. Ray Dorsey from the University of Rochester Medical School. So let's start by showing you just, uh, let's focus on this patient first. So this is a patient who happens to live in assisted living community. So here you see this uh, green uh, rectangle is our device. And you see this blue line is two hours of movement from this person. So you see he's moving between his bed, his chair. So here is like a kitchen area. He has a microwave. He can cook some stuff. He enters the bathroom. He comes back, he, like all of that stuff. So this is about two hours of his movements. And what we do is that we put this device with, uh, with these patients, Parkinson patients, and we try first to understand their life understand their health completely passively. So let me, let me explain this graph to you. So first, this graph is for this patient. So this is the patient, and this is uh, our understanding of his life just purely by analyzing the radio signal. So every circle here is one day of his life. The innermost circle, this one, is the first day of the study. The outermost circle is the last day of the study. Zero here at the top is midnight and 12 at the bottom is noontime. So let's, uh, let's look at this, uh, this graph. So first let's look at the blue. Blue refers to the time when he's asleep in bed. So you can see at the beginning of the study, like here near the inner circle, the blue is very fragmented. So his sleep is really bad, like just he's hardly getting any sleep. And as the study continues, this blue is starting to consolidate and his sleep is improving drastically. So, so Parkinson actually is a disease where sleep gets impacted badly and you can see this effect on this patient. Now, another thing that you see is this green all over this place. It's just like the, the whole graph is green. And green refers to the time he's sitting on a chair. So here, like if I go back, you see that he likes to sit on this chair. So he wakes up, sits on this chair. And you look at this graph and you see green all over the place. So this is a person who wakes up, sits on a chair, and this is virtually all that he does with his life. So this is, of course, it's very bad because I mean, for particularly older people, like if you are very sedentary, that leads to many exacerbation in variety of comorbidities. Another thing that you see is this cone of yellow around 8 a.m. in the morning. So you see where I'm moving my cursor, this is a cone of yellow here. So yellow refers to the time he goes to the bathroom. So one of the things that when, my, when me and my student looked at this graph, it's just like, why, why is he like waking up around 3, 4 a.m., sitting on a chair until exactly 8 a.m. in the morning, and then at 8 a.m. he does his, his showering and toileting? Like, 
all of us or the majority of us, we, we wake up, we typically go and do our sh showering and toileting. Why is this person waiting until 8 a.m. in the morning exactly to go to the bathroom? So it, like when the doctor looked at this, he said, he said, oh, wow, this is interesting that it turns out that basically what is happening here is that remember, like this person lives in assisted living community. So at 8 a.m., the health worker comes. So this person sits on a chair waiting for somebody to come around 8 a.m. to help him with his showering and toileting. And People didn't realize how much he's dependent on this person. But when you when you look at a graph like this, the doctor was saying this is really like bad because it means that this person cannot do the basic things of showering and toileting on his own. Now, another thing that you can see here is a cone of white between 17 and 18. So you see this cone of white here refers to the time that he's outside the coverage area of the radio signal. So when he leaves his unit, we cannot see him and we don't track him. So we see, we see this white cone. And this is between 17 and 18, so between 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. So every day, almost every day, between 5 and 6 p.m., he leaves his room. And this is because he really wants to have dinner with the rest of the people in the assisted living community. So you see this ritual, but you see that on a very specific day, he actually comes back early, like here where I'm moving my cursor. So this person on this day, he didn't feel well. He had actually to come back early. So just by putting a smarter Wi-Fi-like box in his room without asking him or asking anyone for any information or any wearables, we just have a whole vision of his life his ability to do his basic toileting, showering, his sleep, his ritual, and also when he, he had to break these ritual because he was not feeling well. So all of this information is passive. Now, another thing that is really interesting, particularly when you are monitoring people who have diseases, is to actually check whether you are confirming the gold standard, like how the doctors assess the severity of Parkinson's. So here, what you see on the x-axis is something called the MDS-UPDRS. So all that you have to know for this presentation is that the MDS-UPDRS uh, measures the severity of Parkinson's. So basically, 100 is much more severe. It's actually pretty severe Parkinson than, like, for example, more severe than 40. So this is measure the severity of Parkinson. And to assess the MDS-UPDRS, you typically have to bring people to the clinic and like the, the clinician will spend three hours on average to assess this test. It takes a very long time. So what you can see is that in the home, just by measuring the gauge speed of people, every dot here is one person, we can assess something that is highly correlated to the gold standard in assessing Parkinson disease. Another thing that was very interesting is to be able to capture response to medications. So again, for people who don't know about Parkinson's disease, I mean, Parkinson's disease is a motion disorder. Like I'm sure all of you have seen people with Parkinson and have seen that they have tremor. And they, but what the kind of, uh, of medications that we have for Parkinson is called levodopa. And unfortunately, it's a medication that controls the symptoms, but actually it does not cure the disease. So it's only controlling the symptom. And one of the hardest things for, for a doctor is to try to adjust the dose of levodopa for the patient so that the patient stays at a steady level, like they, they actually get enough levodopa so that they, they control the symptoms, but not too much because like any drug is a poison. So you don't want to give too much of that drug to the patient, but just enough to control the symptom. So what I'm going to show you here on the x-axis is the hour of the day. So 4 means 4 a.m., uh, like 14 is 2 p.m. So you see 24 hours on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the average gait speed of a particular patient. And let me plot this graph for you. So this is a graph that we it's typically is, uh, used in medicine, and it's called the box plot. And I just want you to look at the red line. So the red line is the average gait speed of this person for every uh, 15 minutes, sorry, for every half an hour in the day. So you just see like track the red line. So interestingly, 
So you see that the red line goes up and down. So the ability of this person, the gait of this person is not steady. It's just going up and down. And one thing that is interesting, now you just can plot on top of this, the medications. So this person actually takes his medication around 6.30 in the, in the, in the morning. And you can see immediately as he takes his medication, his gait speed starts going up. So he can move much, much faster now. And then after some point, the medication effect starts wearing off and you see the gait speed just going down. And then he takes his second dose of levodopa and now the gait speed again starts going up. And then after about two hours, the effect of medication starts wearing off. He takes another dose and another dose. Every time he takes a dose, he he his med, his he takes the medication. His gaze improve, and then after some time, the medication wears off, and you see like the dipping, and that's very interesting because actually this is not a good behavior. Like you don't want the person to have these like ups and downs in their uh, motor symptoms. This fluctuation is bad and impact both the functionality of the patient and even their ability to interact with people. So you would like this, this red line to be steady throughout the day and then go down in the evening when the patient is about to go to sleep. So by knowing this, now the doctor can adjust the dose of medication to try to keep this line as a straight line. But without this, they have no idea what is going on with the patient. So let me show you our last uh, result, which is actually one of the most interesting thing that I found. This is, we haven't published this yet. We, uh, it's very recent. And this is a collaboration with uh, University of Rochester, uh, Mass General Hospital and Mayo Clinic. So can AI detect Parkinson's from nocturnal breathing? Can I just diagnose someone using machine learning uh, just by looking at their breathing. Now, again, we all know that Parkinson is a motor symptoms. Like it's like we, di we diagnose Parkinson based on tremor, based on movement. But the problem when you diagnose Parkinson based on movement is that we end up diagnosing Parkinson five to 10 years after that actually the disease has started. So if you want to diagnose Parkinson early, we need to find something else to use to diagnose Parkinson. And one of the things that we started thinking about is, can we actually use this radio signal? And we know that we can get easily the breathing of patients. Uh, so can we just look at whether the machine learning model would know whether somebody has Parkinson from their breathing? And so this is our device. And we just take the breathing of the, of the person. We train the machine learning model that is specific for this task. And let me show you the results. So we can actually from the wireless signal and by transforming the wireless signal to an into the, to a uh, uh, like a middle stage interpretation that is breathing, we can actually with accuracy that is about 90%, AUC 90% to be able to tell whether somebody has Parkinson or not. So, so that's, that's actually very interesting because today you can never give breathing to a doctor and say, can you diagnose whether the patient has Parkinson's? So not only we are training models to do what doctors do, we want to train models to do things that doctors today cannot do and extract new information that otherwise potentially is infeasible. And one of the things, so now that we know that wireless signals from nocturnal breathing can, can diagnose Parkinson, we started asking the question, can we diagnose that somebody has Parkinson before actually a doctor diagnoses them? So can we actually predict and then check after a few years that the person indeed got Parkinson's? So unfortunately, like we don't have so many people from whom we have signals before, uh, like many years before they got diagnosed. So, but we have very few patients that we have signals, we have their breathing about five years. Uh, we have their breathing five years before they were diagnosed for Parkinson's disease. So let me show you this graph. So in blue, you see the, the patients who eventually in, in five years down the road, they, they were telling us during the visit that they have Parkinson's. In red, you see people who never got diagnosed for Parkinson. 
And you see this yellow line is the threshold of our model. And you can see that the model actually can tell like for about 75% of the people that eventually got diagnosed with Parkinson, that actually they kind of like look like Parkinson patients. While the people who never got Parkinson, the model is sure about them that they don't have Parkinson's. This is very promising because, I mean, this is of course very, very initial results. So we, we need to do many more tests with much larger population than this to be able to confirm it. But it is very promising because it would be one way to try to detect Parkinson's early. And if we have any chance to develop drugs for Parkinson disease, you need to be able to detect it early. I wanna show you, actually I'm going to, uh, because of time, I'm going to uh, jump quickly and just uh, jump to this part. So uh, one of the things that we also did is to be able to monitor COVID-19 with our devices. And this is a study with Harvard Medical School with Dr. Ipsed Vahia. And we, uh, we were asked when, uh, probably all of you remember the time when in, your, in the retirement homes, there was a, a breakout of COVID and many people died. Uh, during that time, people in retirement homes came to us and asked us to use our device because it's completely contactless. So there is no danger of contagion. So they asked us to monitor people with COVID to check whether they are recovering. Because remember, like when you have somebody who has COVID, they have to quarantine and be alone. And if that person is somebody who is old, they have comorbidity, they have memory problems and Alzheimer's, it is very uh, dangerous that you are quarantining them and you don't know whether they are recovering smoothly or not. So we started monitoring these COVID patients and we were looking for the recovery and whether the recovery is a smooth one or not. So let me show you our, our results. So this is breathing from a, a patient who has COVID. And you see on April 7, the breathing rate is about 23 breaths per minute. Four days later on April 11, you can see that the breathing rate went down to 18 breaths per minute. So as the patient is recovering, like his breathing is getting back to the baseline. In fact, for this patient, the breathing is the baseline is pretty much near 18 breaths per minute. So breathing, one of the things that happens during COVID, of course, COVID affects the, the respiratory system and you get the breathing elevated. And then as the person recover, they, the breathing goes back to normal. Another thing that happens is mobility. So COVID causes a humongous amount of fatigue. And what you see here, this uh, green dot is a patient. You can see the movement on April 8 versus April 11. And you can see on April 11, the patient is much more agile, moving much faster and also uh, more balanced. So moving from the, in both cases, moving from the chair to the bathroom. Now, of course, not all cases are uh, like everything is fine. Sometimes actually we see, uh, for example, this is a patient and you see this is actually the breathing of the patient. This is very abnormal breathing that we see in this patient. And instead, like remember the breathing, the inhales, exhales, the nice sinusoidal movement that I showed you earlier. So he, here you see that this patient has both the magnitude of each breast is very irregular and also like some breaths uh, is much wider, both the magnitude and the frequency of the breathing is changing from one breath to the next. Very abnormal breathing. It turned out that breathing actually is a very important metric for COVID. And if we actually have the ability to monitor breathing, we can get much more information than otherwise. So let me show you this graph. So this is uh, a case for a patient who got re-hospitalized because of COVID. And let me explain this. So each curve here is a histogram of breathing. So this, and it is one day. So you see, for example, the first day is April uh, 8th. And you see the histogram of breathing. So you can see that it's like the tip here, the mode is uh, slightly below 20 breaths per minute. So every, every one of these histograms is one day. So you see at the beginning, the patient is breathing rate is decreasing, going slowly toward the baseline. And then on April 14, suddenly the breathing rate jumps up 
And the patient, in fact, on that day ended up in the hospital for, for breathing problem. So you can see like the breathing got really changed. And then the patient actually, you see like here, the patient spent one week in the hospital from April 14 until April 21st. And then when she came back, she again, like if you monitor the breathing, you see the breathing rate goes back to normal gradually. And eventually the patient recovered and um, was fine. But when we monitored like in our population, we are able to see three types of patients. So patients who actually uh, are symptomatic and they get problems like the patient that got re-hospitalized and you can see from the breathing that the breathing was moving gradually and then jumped up. And so those are people who have problems with recovery. Then you see another type of patients who are symptomatic, but everything goes smoothly. So patients recover and while the patient is suffering, but eventually everything moves in the right direction and the patient recovers without uh, ending up being re-hospitalized. And then finally, you see these asymptomatic patients that we all have heard about who have no symptoms, like they are positive for COVID, but they have no symptoms. And again, their breathing shows that very clearly. And uh, we see it also in the other, in the other metrics that we monitor. So this gets me to the end of this presentation. So really what I presented to you is a new way of, think, of thinking about uh, getting health monitoring, but instead of like relying on wearable, which are nice and good, but they are limited, we are talking about this new notion of the invisibles. Can we just change the environment so that it can monitor our health, our well-being, without wearables, without charging devices, without wearing devices, just have this ambient intelligence, this uh, invisible intelligence in the environment. Now, before ending, I want just to add one thing. Of course, privacy and security are very, very important. And we are seeing people through walls and getting their vitals without uh, through walls. So, so privacy is uh, a big uh, thing that we work on. And uh, we do address privacy both in terms of technology and in terms of designing method that would prevent access to information that for people who are not authorized to do it and like physical methods, not like just based on cryptography because I can take that device and turn it and face the wall uh, and start monitoring my colleague here through the wall, but that will not be dealt with with crypto. You need a new ways of understanding security and privacy. And also through, of course, IRB, every single study that we do, we do with a, uh, by getting uh, IRB approval, checking ethics and getting informed consent from patients and individuals. So I'll stop here and take any questions. First of all, I want to thank you, Dina, for an amazing talk. Extremely interesting. So there's not such a possibility of thank you. So there are questions, first of all, in the Q and A, and after that, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to let somebody else ask. So do you see the Q and A? Uh, oh, maybe I can read it to you. So the first question is: Can this yeah. method be extended to visualize what happens in the cell deep in the body, like ultrasound, can we even detect what RNA is being transcribed inside the cell? Yeah, so, so I think, so there are two things that are different. So can it be extended to, to track what happens inside the body versus can it be done on the cell level, at the cell level? And I think the, the, so the answer is that we need more research along that line. So I can tell you, for example, one of the things that one, the first extension to within the body, one of the things that we were very interested in is can we like, for example, get the vitals of, uh, of a baby in, 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 uh, in the womb and also uh, getting information from inside the body. And we didn't do it with babies, but we did it with a, uh, a, an embryo, like a turkey that is inside an egg so we started monitoring a turkey baby inside his egg, and we, we were able to get his respiration before actually he was, he, he hatched. And eventually he hatched and we had to deal with a turkey in C-cell, Chef. 
we, we called him Tim, which is the, the inverse of MIT Tim. And then we, I had a turkey running in my lab. Uh, so then that part of the study stopped. And uh, then going back to the cell stuff actually is very, very interesting because I depend, like you, I think to go and monitor things inside the cell, there is an interesting way to try to think about it. One has to go to frequencies that are much higher so that you can get very small wavelengths because you are interested in very small movements and changes. So that is possible. It gets it just needs more, uh, it's a different research, and uh, but there is an opportunity there. The next question um, was uh, by Siri, uh, do they need sleeping to detect this? So this was at 11.47, so I assume that had something to do with the Parkinson uh, breathing. Uh, I think. Uh, Sarah, if you're online, maybe you can... Let's assume Sorry. that was the question. Yeah. So, uh, so can can they need to do they need to sleep? So to sleep, I think it was part of your talk when you were talking about uh, the breathing uh, frequency for the Parkinson patients, and the question was whether they need to be sleeping for this detection. Yeah. So, so we do it during sleep for for two reasons. So, one thing is that basically when you go to sleep. So breathing and many of our vitals, they change drastically throughout the day, not because of our health. Like when I talk, of course, my breathing is modulating my sleep. So that has nothing to do with my health. It really has to do with what I'm saying. So, so it's one of the things that I learned is that sleep is really very interesting normalization of the body. So you want to get like a resting state so that you can compare across people, compare across days. So, so this is why we, we like to use the nocturnal breathing and nocturnal information. So we did it with nocturnal breathing. The other thing with Parkinson's, so independent of our work, there, was, there were multiple studies that look at EEG of people during sleep. And they also show that it's different from, 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 the, from, the, from normal individual and particularly different they see differences during REM and during the transition from awake to sleep. Mm -hmm. So what we, what we saw in our model, although we are using breathing, not EEG, but it focuses on these periods for the Parkinson patient, the transition between sleep and awake and how it happens. The next question is, while this application offers great promise for healthcare, the technology described also offers unprecedented tool for continuous, inexpensive, and superstitious invasion of privacy. Okay, as you've developed the ML models and associated hardware, have you considered complementary methods to thwart such monitoring? Is there a straightforward way for individuals to confound the models or swamp the relevant radio signals? Yeah, so, so this is really interesting because as uh, like one of the issues that when, even like when we started looking at it, of course, I mean, just the pure fact that you are seeing people through walls without even having them to wear something on their body, you, you immediately think about privacy. And I think there is really interesting space about uh, privacy and like a method for privacy for, for that use physical actions. So one of the things that we designed, for example, is we started using something like challenge response. So in challenge response, challenge response, of course, something that we use in computer science when somebody wants to access something to prove that they are human. So like they give you this picture and you have to like count, I don't know, like how many sub pictures have uh, a traffic light yeah. or tell what is in the picture. So, so this, uh, you can imagine because our device can monitor how people move in space. So the challenge response here is a physical challenge response. It's a device saying, okay, Dina, if you are saying you want me to monitor you and this is you, just take a step now to the right. Now take two steps, like you can have this random challenge response that is based on physical movement. And if the person cannot satisfy the challenge and not respond to the challenge, then you say, okay, so Dina, you are asking me to monitor this, maybe someone else, I'm not gonna do it. And then you also ask them to walk the space that they are requesting to monitor to, to, to prove that they have access to it. Now, there are other things that one could do also on the jamming level. Like for example, you can always jam 
any radio signal to prevent it from being uh, accessible. But that requires generating signals. Uh, would, uh, so, so, so there are many questions in that domain. I think it is both like it has to be addressed both with technology, but also I think it's very important to be addressed with policy. Like, as I said, for anything independent of these security and privacy issues, there are ethical issues when you are collecting any health information. And one has to go through IOB, one has to have informed consent, all of that stuff. So in terms of jamming, is this similar to what you had with jamming for the uh, the devices that were implanted? Uh, to, so you had a necklace, I remember, that could jam uh, people, tr people trying to maybe disrupt your heart fibrillator or, or something like that, right? Yeah. Wow, I'm quite impressed. I still remember, yes. <laughs> yes, it's along the same line. Okay, the next question was... Um, when you uh, when you uh, talked about separating different people, um, there was a you said that you have some uh, work on that, and I was wondering um, whether that was whether you knew. I guess a two stage that just you see there are five people and you can tell there are five people and, and what signal belongs to which person. Do you know who those people are in advance? Is it like supervised that way? Yeah, yeah so, so this is interesting. So it's like a difference between separating people and identifying people. So we we have done work on identification and what we do is not identification, but re-identification. So basically, uh, my interest is really not to know who's who, but is like, okay, to be able to tell that this is the same person again and again and again. And then if the person th at the first time this is introduced as a patient, then I know that this is a patient. I don't actually want to know who the other people are because I don't want to identify them. I only want to identify my patient from the rest of the people. And we did work in, uh, on this, this problem, actually it's equivalent or analogous to a problem that exists in machine vision, it's called WE-ID. And we can re-identify people from their wireless signals. So I guess uh, my, my question was, how does it relate to uh, sound separation? Because I know there's a lot of work on sound separation and it sounded more similar to that. And, and, I, and I guess it leads to, Suppose you had a system for sound separation. Can you use it in conjunction with your um, your system for movement? Yeah. So, so yeah. So actually, I mean, sound and and radio and all of these signals are just like they are all waves, and there is so much that is similar. Like in fact, I was saying like it is like originally like it's the foundation is in radar, but sonar is very much similar to radar. So uh, so sound separation is kind of, there are similarities, but there are some differences. So similarities first, like basically you can beam your signal, whether it's sound or ultrasound or RF, you can beam your signal so that you can separate voxels in space from each other. And you can also design that signal, like that FMCW, that frequency that changes linearly with time that I talked about, also gives you distance. In fact, because RF is, is, uh, is a complex number, it's not, it's like it has a wave, it kind of like gives you distance because basically depending on the phase of the signal, because it rotates with distance, you have information about distance that you typically don't see in, in uh, the visible light thing. For example, so you do you do have direction from the from the beam, and you have a, a distance that you leverage that is related to the to the wave and the FMCW. Uh, so so that also shared with with sound. Right. Uh, the other thing that the the problem with RF bounces a lot of the walls, and the bouncing effect is slightly different from how sound bounces and the wavelength is different in size. So there are certain things the, and like the absorbance and the, the, the material and all of that stuff, slightly different. So there are so many relations uh, or similarities between radio waves and sound waves and all waves in general. So you actually uh, brought me to my next question, which is uh, about the bouncing uh, in walls. So could you use this in an outside, in a different environment, in water, let's say, or when you don't have walls, but you have other mediums that you're... Yeah, so, so outside, yeah, no problem. In fact, outside is easier in the sense that it's, uh, they have 
you have fewer things for the signal to bounce off and create a big mass. Uh, in the body, actually, is really interesting because uh, RF signal, uh, so the decay of RF signal in the human body is exponential. So it, it decays very, very quickly. So you can't get what we call deep tissue unless you have very different design to, 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 to get deep tissue. Now, there are certain things that you can do to get deep tissue, but it's not as simple as inside the body, it's just yet another medium because the, the, the signal dies exponentially. And so very, very quickly, you are dealing with very, very minute signal. Uh, another question here. Oops, some of the questions disappeared. Uh, wait, wait. It was, uh, thank you for a great talk. Everybody says thank you. I didn't read those, but... Um, a curious about the nocturnal breathing induced RF signal generation mechanism. So they're curious about the mechanism. I don't, um, I don't know if that's a question. Sorry. So What's it says, question? thank you for a great talk. Curious about the nocturnal breathing induced RF signal generation mechanism. The nocturnal breathing induced, okay. So, so basically like at the high level, what is happening here? We, so we had, so it is, the model of course is a neural network model. It's, it's a complex multi-neural network model. One of the biggest problem that you are, you would face when you are trying to deal with modality, with a new modality like radio signal, particularly in modality that is difficult and you don't have historic data for it. So it's not like we have to collect the data with the Parkinson patient. It's not like we have his, like, I don't know, like signal, RF signal from, uh, 10,000 Parkinson patient in the past, that doesn't exist. So one of the things that's really important is to translate into an intermediate representation for whom, for which you have a large amount of signals. So when, so that's one very important thing and we always deal with this issue and use this as an architectural uh, design principle. So in the case of Parkinson's, so one of the things that we have to think about, okay, so to be able to run a neural network on Parkinson detection and actually not only detection, we can even tell the severity of the disease. We, we needed to get data from a large number of people, both who have Parkinson and who don't have Parkinson's. And we, with our device, we can get 100 people, but we can't get 10,000. So what we decided to do is to use nocturnal breathing, because if we do that, then we can go and like find all the sleep studies from all of these hospitals. So this is our collaboration with Mayo Clinic, with Mass General, with all of these sites and say, okay, so we want your, your sleep studies and you want you to go back to also the, the, the medical record and see who has Parkinson, who doesn't have Parkinson. Now we take that data, which has this respiration and we take the respiration from our device and use that as an intermediate stage of the, of the design of the model so that the model can transfer between the two representation, the two modalities very easily using this intermediate representation, which is respiration, nocturnal breathing. So, right. so that's, that's, that's a cornerstone in the design of the model. Now, of course, there are many other things because I mean, this is a very weak signal in a sense. Um. I, maybe last question. Uh, I mean, no, two questions. <laughs> One is, uh, so I, I, you talked about uh, the issue of, of medication efficacy and what level of medication you need. So I, I find the connection to depression and, uh, and medi medication for depression very interesting because that seems to me to be a field that has exploded uh, probably even during COVID, you know, getting a lot of depression med medication, not so much monitoring and maybe this gives some kind of help for that. Did you think about that? Is there any research on that? Yeah, so, so actually I think depression and in, in general, what's called mood uh, disorders are very, very good area where you need something like this. Because first of all, I mean, we, we have no good biomarkers for these kind of diseases. So having behavioral biomarker is very important. Sleep is, it's a platform for all mood disorders. 
and movement and withdrawal and being able to see how the patient is moving or the person is moving whether there is a withdrawal in their in their actions and stuff like that so so this is very interesting we haven't done major studies like the one that we have done in other disease areas in depression yet uh, I'm very interested. I'm just uh, like typically we work, we need a doctor, a specialist when, when we work in a disease area who, who has the patient, who has access to them. But we saw many of the patients in our other studies or even healthy individuals, not patients who went through depressive mode and we see that in their signal. In fact, the first time we ran into depression was we were not doing, we were doing sleep studies. We were collecting data about sleep and it was a healthy individual, uh, a young uh, student who nobody would have thought about depression or anything like that. But it's like, basically we saw her signal just like REM is happening too early. Is it like, is it a mistake in our device? But then the ground truth was saying the same thing. It's like, what's going on? And then we started learning that actually in one, one of the, uh, the things that happened in depression is that REM starts happening too early. And uh, if you think about depression uh, drugs, like there is SSRIs, which are also called REM oppressant. So, so being able to monitor continuously in the home, monitoring sleep, monitoring behavior, I think it's very important for understanding depression, understanding your relapses into depression uh, without like overwhelming the person. It's like, okay, write me a diary every day. And this is exactly the thing that a depressed person doesn't want to do. And then the other thing that is very interesting is the drugs for depression, because not everyone, the same drug doesn't work for everyone the same way. And typically it takes long time. Like sometimes you put someone on a drug too long and it's not working for them. So if one could use this information to very quickly decide whether the drug is working or not for a patient, I think that would be very helpful. So, so depression is a very, very interesting area that I think we can do a lot of novel work. We just need the right doctor to work with. Wow. So thank you, Dina, uh, for an amazing uh, talk and, uh, and for your answers. And uh, thanks again. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Shafi, for inviting me. And thank you all. And it was a pleasure. Thanks. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.